Well, listeners, a very, very warm welcome back to Cornwall Science Sessions, your weekly science show with myself, that's Ben, and of course with... Welcome Sam. Yes, excellent. Right, today, before we go any further, we're going to just tell you now, this is a bat special, okay? And we've got someone very special on the line with us right now. Hannah Van Hesteren from the Bat Conservation Trust. Let's see if we can connect through to her. Hannah, can you hear us? Morning. Yeah. Good, good morning. Morning, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. How are you doing? Me? Yeah, well, very well. Excellent. Excellent stuff. Well, Sam, you've got the first question, right? Let's fire away. Hi, Hannah. Um, I was just wondering, sort of, I guess the first obvious question is, why should the public care about bats? Well, there's a million reasons why you should care about bats. Um, there's lots of myths that surround bats, which makes people think that they're scary, but they're not. They're incredible little mammals. They're the only flying mammal in the whole world. Um, and they've seen massive number losses over the last century. They've lost a lot of their natural habitats. They've lost their homes. They've lost their insect food because of um, intensified agricultural practices. So they really do need our help. They, um, they only eat insects in the UK, so they're amazing pest controllers as well. Having bats around is actually a sign of a really healthy ecosystem. If you've got bats in your local area, then you live in a really nice space. So it's really important to look after them and make sure that they have got places to live. Oh, that's really cool. Um, and I guess the sort of obvious next things to do is to say is how can the public help control or help improve uh, bat populations? So again, there's lots of ways. Um, the biggest way that we say is to provide your bats with bed and breakfast. So um, building bat boxes and things like that, little crevices that bats can live in, that's really helpful for them. A lot of the bats in the UK are crevice dwellers. So they like to get into little nooks and crannies. Um, but when they're sleeping there, when they wake up in the evening, they'll, they'll want something to eat as well. So attracting insects to your garden will attract natural predators like bats. So if you have uh, flowering plants that um, flower all the way from spring through to autumn, their bats will have something to eat. They'll have lots of nice moths and midges to eat. Uh, and if you've got water, maybe a pond or a standing bird table of water, something like that, the bats will be able to drink from there. But also a lot of insects will spend part of their life cycle in the water as well. So it's another source of food for the bats. Um, and finally, you can also volunteer for bats. So there's lots of surveys that people can get involved in in their local area. Um, and, you know, public engagement, talking about bats, making sure people are aware of how special they are and how they're not mice and they're not scary and they're not dangerous. Oh, that's really cool. And so if a member of the public finds a, a bat, say it's injured or just spots a bat, what, what should be their uh, course of action? Well, essentially, if you ever see a bat that's not being a bat, if it's not flying around at night, it's probably in need of some help. So bats are really um, shy animals. They're not going to be around where they're uh, vulnerable to predators, so they won't be on the floor or the wall during the day. If you do find them like that, then they're definitely injured or... Um, maybe dehydrated or there's something wrong going on. So the best thing you can do is put on a pair of gloves, never handle a bat with bare hands, put on a pair of gloves and contain the bat into a box and give us a call on the National Bat Helpline. We can then try and put you in touch with a local volunteer. Thanks to um, the amazing work of over 400 volunteers in, in the UK, we're able to put people all, all over the UK in touch with amazing bat workers who can help um, rehabilitate and look after our bats. So the aim is to rehabilitate them and release them um, Oh, eventually <laughs> that sounds great brilliant well thanks so much hannah that all sounds very good to us but essentially it sounds to me like bats just like to get cozy and you should leave them to get cozy in their trees Definitely. and things yeah very cozy <laughs> excellent ladies and gents that was hannah van hesteren from the bat conservation trust hannah thanks very much for joining us thank you cheers hannah see you thank you bye right well that was hannah um moving on then as I told you before, this is a bat special, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I know what you're thinking. I'm not convinced yet. Well, I hope you're not thinking that. But if you are, this fact, this fact, okay, will convince you. Sam, Sam check this out. Listen, have, give this a listen, right? I this is know. Ellie, okay? Ellie Kent. She's <coughs> going to be talking to us a bit later, um, so she'll introduce herself properly then. But for now, just listen to this fact, all right? Bats are the only pollinator of the plant that makes tequila. So if you oh, didn't have right. bats, yeah. you wouldn't have tequila. So if you like tequila, then you oh, should well, look yeah. after bats. There, there we go. <laughs> I'm sold, actually. I'm going to go out and uh, help bats now, yeah. now that I know that fact. <laughs> I'm pretty sold, so, though. Yeah, there we go. I think we are sold, aren't we? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a fan of bats anyway. But if they're making tequila as well, 
exactly. don't know if they're working in the factories, but... No, I probably think. not. Anyway, right, moving on then. Let's get to the main feature of today's BAT special. We've got two main features coming up, actually. So first up, we've got an interview with Chris Smith. Now, Chris, great guy. He's actually the secretary for the BAT Conservation Trust, okay, um, in the Midlands. So we're going to talk to him a little bit, find about find out how he became involved with bats in the first place. He's going to be telling us a little bit about their importance and things as well. So here is the interview with Chris. Hope you enjoy. Originally, I was a child surveyor. And as a child surveyor, um, you come across bats when you're doing building conversions and stuff like that. And um, bought a farmhouse, was doing the conversion, refurbishment to the farmhouse, and we had bats. And... Everyone was saying, no, 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 you won't be able to do anything. The bats would, you know, ruin all your development. But it wasn't. It was easy. We accommodated the bats. The bats came back in that next um, winter. They weren't there in the summer. They would tend to be there in the autumn, the spring, and the winter. And it was dead easy. And I used to go up into my loft, and there were these little furry plums on the, um, on the ridge board, and that was my bats. And so that got me into just being interested about bats. And... Um, because bats are a protected species, you actually have to have a license to work with them. So I joined the local bat group and then got a license. And so then about 2005, six, started doing survey work, looking for bats and designing schemes around bats. So where people have got bats in houses or barn conversions or anything like that, designing schemes to accommodate the bats and... Um, that now is, is my full-time job. It sounds great. I mean, before, before you got involved with it, were you kind of aware of the, of the importance of bats for, for, for ecology? Because I guess that's, that's one thing which, um, I mean, I, I myself didn't really know anything about the importance of bats. I just assumed they're just these rare little animals which you can't be able to come across. <laughs> but actually, majorly important, aren't they? Yeah, and I think I didn't. As, as a surveyor, I was aware of bats because of their presence and use of buildings. But actually, until I actually became involved with the back group and then tried to um, you know, learn more and then become licensed, didn't understand about bats with regard to ecology, biodiversity, and the impact they have and on, on the whole ecosystem and how good they are as, a, as an indicator of biodiversity and, and your level of insect populations which then you know it reflects on so many other elements and it's an easy thing to measure not just thinking about the uk now but for example one one of the facts which i always like to think about is if you like tequila then you've got bats to thank for, for tequila yeah. because they're actually pollinators of the exactly agave. <laughs> so. exactly and i do one of the one of the part of my job as well is i do volunteer volunteer work for natural england so i go and help out um householders who suddenly find they've got bats or have a bat fly into the house um and as part of that what we do is we do um we're promoting bats we go and do talks to schools and and scout groups and, and all that sort of thing and when you talk to people when you go and see a group of kids i can always guarantee that you know if i say right kids what do you know about bats? Does anyone know the name of a bat? And the two that come up are fruit bats yeah. and vampire bats. Yeah, and course. it's just because everybody knows it. But like you say, you've got, you've got bats there with tequila, they're pollinators, they, they eat frogs, they eat fish, they eat insects. They're just they're yeah. amazing. People focus on the vampire bats, but I mean, that's a handful of species. It's it? And in very limited <clears throat> area in the world, <clears throat> but they've got a reputation and sometimes that is it's a good way into talking to kids and other groups about about bats because people know about vampires and they see so much from films and that so actually it's a way to talking to them and then you can actually tell them about how little that really really relates to the real bat so what you see on the films is so far away from what reality is yeah i think i mean the actual science behind bats is actually much cooler i mean I think cooler than vampire bats is actually just the the, for, the way in which they navigate many species using echolocation, which it sounds like something out of sci-fi anyway, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it, like a sonar that, that this animal is using yeah. to detect its prey. And they and they they they're using this ultrasound. They're picking it up with their ears. They're using it to give themselves in the total darkness a complete understanding of their environment. 
you know, everything from, from where the trees are so they don't fly into a tree to, yeah. to where midges, where gnats and mosquitoes are so they can actually catch them on the wing. Incredible but, resolution. Yeah, it is an amazing... And this is from a tiny little brain mm-hmm. that they're doing this and some of them shout, you know, uh, it comes out of their mouth, some of their nose. That they've, they've got such clever adaptations and different species or at different frequencies to then work with different... Insect prey. Yeah. Um, so yes, amazing little creatures. Yeah, and I think as, as well we should we should mention that Cornwall is a particularly cool place for bats, isn't it? Yes, and there are species that are yeah, Cornwall. Or just around Falmouth, you have nine of the seventeen species of bats, but you have two of the rarest species, the lesser and greater horseshoes. Um, greater horseshoes particularly rare to the point where a lot of the maternity roosts. So in in the summer. The females gather, give birth to the young, young learn to fly, and then they disperse um, often in the autumn. But maternity roosts, because maternity roosts of um, greater horseshoes are quite rare, they, a lot of them are monitored to the point where um, at Woodchester Mansions near Gloucester, all of the bats from there, all the greater horseshoes, are ringed. So Roger Ransom, who runs the project there, rings his bats and then... When other people are monitoring bats in other parts of the country, they can look at these ring numbers. So we know that bats from Gloucester travel across to Pembrokeshire, they travel down to Dorset, they travel certainly into uh, Somerset and North Devon. And so these bats are really rare and they're travelling all over the place. So the network of these rare bats, it's mad to think really that it's all going on unbeknown to us, because of course... I mean, if people wanted to see bats, what, how would you recommend they go about seeing them? I mean, you can see them in any environment, really, can't you? Yeah. You just choose the correct times. Of, yeah, of and it is, it is time, because in the winter, they're going to be hibernating. So there's, if it's a warm day, they will come out, have a look around, have a drink. If there's any insects, they'll maybe feed. But the majority of bats are going to be in hibernation throughout the winter. So they're going to reduce their body temperature down to the ambient temperature. So five or six degrees centigrade. And they'll just shut their body down, they'll live off their fat, they'll slow their heart rate down, slow their breathing down. And then in the spring, as the insects start to become more prevalent, the bats become more active. So the time to look for bats and see them is to go out in the evenings, spring, summer and autumn, with summer being the best time because you've got more insects. Um, And you're tending to go out after dark, and that's the awkward bit because... You're going out as it's going dark. You can't see the bats. The bats have got echolocation, so they, they're happy as loud you going out in the sure, dark. Yeah. And, and so it's, if you know where there's a rooster bats, you can often stand there and watch them fly out. But one of the best ways of finding out is to, is to contact like local bat groups who do walks, and they'll do a walk on summer evenings where they know there are bats, so they know they can take the public out. You can have a walk around for an hour or two as the sun goes down, they can show you bats, but also they'll take out bat detectors, which will convert the, the sonar echolocation from an ultrasound that we can't hear into something that we can. So you can actually go around and you can hear different species of bats. And within an evening, anyone can, can quickly learn to identify three or four species of bats. Um, so it, it's, it's ever so easy to go out That's and find a, out about it. lovely idea, actually, getting in touch with the, with the local group. In fact, we could put those uh, details on on our Facebook page for any listeners that are interested in, in doing that, getting in touch and learning about bats and hearing, hearing their calls in, well, in a format which we can actually hear. Yeah. Because in, in, in the wild, of course, you can't hear this um, ultrasound. I mean, speaking of echolocation as well, you've given us a, an excellent present here, haven't you? I've got, <laughs> I'm holding a cassette here. and it, Could you explain again what's on this cassette tape for us to okay, listen to? Okay, <laughs> this, this cassette was made in 2001 by a guy called Dave King. Dave King... Um, runs a company and he makes bat detectors. That's what he, his job is since he designs new detectors, all sorts of different bat detectors. Everything from, from something that you know, a member of the public can pick up and walk out with to use to, to ones that professionals need to do um, surveys and, and all that sort of thing. But he's done a cassette there, he's created a cassette and what it is, he's created music only using <laughs> bat echolocation calls. So hopefully you might find that stuff. interesting. <laughs> well, well, we'll definitely have to put this on, I think, in, in this show. So listeners, hang on for that. It's going to be brilliant, I think. Well, my final question for you, actually. What's the coolest bat 
in your view, <laughs> and, and why? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> for me, the coolest bat is the brown long-eared bat. Okay. It's obviously got long ears, as its name suggests. It, you get it pretty much all the way throughout the UK. Um, they're a reasonably common bat. They fly around at night. Quite, they're quite slow flying bats, so they don't go out until about three quarters after sunset. Because as a slow flying bat, they can be picked off by magpies, crows, birds of prey. But what they do is they will fly out, and their echolocation is really, really quiet. Because most of the time, they've got these big ears, and they're just listening for the rustling movement and the flight of um, beetles and moths. Sure. And then they will fly up to a tree where there's a moth, and they will hover, and they will just pick the moth or the beetle off, and then fly off, hang up somewhere, eat the body, discard the wings, and that's just amazing that you know, a bat we have in this country can... can if you go into a roost, they'll fly up to your face and they will obviously look at you <laughs> and assess what you are, but they're just, just hovering in front of you and then fly off again. They're just beautiful, absolutely sounds, amazing. That sounds fantastic. And it's, yeah, I think I'm convinced, I think that sounds like the coolest bat to me as well. I, I particularly like flying foxes, actually. Oh, Very large yes. bats, not, yes. not in the UK, of course. But you can see them in the UK because if you go to a lot of the zoos, increasingly zoos um, operate systems whereby you can go into bat houses. So they've altered okay, wow. the, yeah. the, the day and night regime so that it's night time for the bats in the day when we can go into the zoo. So places like Chester, they have big populations of fruit bats and often oh, they're wow. yeah. um, having populations of fruit bats that are maybe threatened in other parts of the world. So they've run populations where they can breed them and then take them back to the wild. Oh, brilliant. So zoos like Chester, is it another place you can go and see, see bats if, if you're interested? painton has got them as well. Brilliant. That's, that's a bit, bit more local. local. Yeah, great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Ladies and gents, Chris Smith, we haven't heard everything from him yet, so do stay tuned. And actually, we're going to be playing some of that music we promised you. Music made using only bat echolocation calls. But first, it makes sense to talk a little bit more about what actually this bat detector device we've heard about is doing okay so this is how we're actually listening to these bat calls if you like um, to kind of help us get an insight into this and we're going to actually hear some bat calls some real bat calls now as well we spoke to Chris again about uh, what these bat detectors are actually doing so let's listen to that section now the commonest sort of bat detector is called a heterodyne detector okay uh, and it's it's you can buy them for as little as 60 pounds and they allow you to identify the majority of species of bats. Sometimes you get within specific uh, groups of bats, the echolocation calls are very, very similar. So then it might be quite hard to determine which one of, say, five species is. But you know the family of bats. So you know it's a myotid bat, but you maybe then can't tell whether it's a, a naturalist bat or a Dorbenton's bat. Um, but the majority of the bat detectors, the heterodyne detectors, what they do is you adjust the frequency um, that you're listening to. So if you're listening to 45 kilohertz, yep. what it does, it takes the 45 kilohertz sound and then deducts basically 44 kilohertz from it and converts it into something that we can hear at sure. yep. 1 to 5 kilohertz. Yep. So that's how that works. And then the... The ones that are used for sound analysis record it actually as ultrasound. Yes. But obviously we can't hear it. Yes. So we yeah. have to then put it on the computer and play it back and make it into something we can hear. So this is great actually. At a PC now, we've, we've got some um, real bat calls for you. Particularly unusual call that one. I like that one. Often, when we're doing bat walks, that one there is one of the easiest ones for people to um, distinguish. And you always describe it to people as sounding like chip chop, chip chop. Yeah. So it, the kids often refer to it as the chip shop bat. If it's the chip shop bat, you'd love Cornwall then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lot of different types. It's not. It's not just what you'd assume. It's not just uh, you know. No. These are completely different, aren't they? These yeah. And, you're playing and, it. The different bats are using different frequencies because the frequencies, the sound attenuates differently, sure. uh, whether they're in open areas or enclosed areas. Um, so they're using different frequencies and different types of sound. 
sharp peaks. Some of them uh, are doing more low level, that's going long distances, because it depends on what the insects that they are that sure. they're looking for. Ladies and gents, that was Chris Smith. Now, Chris Smith, just to repeat what, what his position is, so he is the secretary of the Bat Conservation Group in Staffordshire. So, Chris, thank you very much for speaking to us today all about bats. Now, I did promise the bat song, so just to repeat, this is the song, right, made entirely using bat echolocation calls. Sam, are you wait, excited? I can't wait for this. Okay, this is the first time you've heard this, right? I've not heard it before, oh. no. Okay, you're going to love it. Let's, let's give this a spin. It's, it's pretty funky. I can't believe this was made in 2001. Funky. It's got a serious beat. <laughs> this has legs. Whew. Whoa, it's getting steamy in the studio, ladies and gents. Whew. Sam, put your shirt back on, mate. <laughs> it's not even... It's not even 8 o'clock and Sam's getting undressed. <laughs> oh, great stuff. Great, great stuff. Great song. Well, and Chris, uh, thanks for that. Sam, sorry. Take it away. So that, that was great. <laughs> so earlier we spoke to Hannah uh, from the uh, Bat Conservation Trust. And she told us that if you find a, a bat that's not behaving normally, that you should get in contact with them on the bat helpline. And the number for that will be 0345 1300 22.8 and the normal network rate will apply if you call that number I've always wanted to say that <laughs> and um, also if you want to look up more about their, their work go to bats.org.uk um, if you weren't a fan of that bat song uh, I guess we'll play something a little bit more well renowned yeah let's go for it Tonight, there's a man in the shadows with the gun in his eye and a blade shining no so bright. There's evil in the hand, there's thunder in the sky, and a killer's on the bloodshot streets. Oh, I'm down in the tunnel with a deadly arise. I know I swear I saw a young boy down in the gutter, he was stopping the foam in the heat. Oh, baby, you're the only thing in this whole world that's pure and good and right. And wherever you are and wherever you go, there's always gonna be some light. But I gotta get out, I gotta break it out now before the final cut of dawn. So we gotta make the most of our one night together when it's over, you know, we'll both be so alone.
stuff beautiful stuff right now it's coming up to eight o'clock so you know what time it is don't we it is weather time with our weatherman sam now sam you know what we need to do right i i can't wait now this his weather backing his weather jingle was actually debuted for the first time last week um and i think you're a big fan aren't you mate yeah i, I think we should just play that on loop or let's give it let's, let's give it a spin mate so uh here's the weather and travel of course the weather. Don't it's laugh, mate. Uh, serious. Ah, <laughs> see me. Hey, and stop that's laughing. Just in the studio. The weather and travel. Ooh. Take it away, Sam. <laughs> okay, mate. You're ready. All right. Well. <clears throat> the headline for today are largely dry with some sunny spurts. It will be a cloudy start for many, and the cloud will tend to thin and break, allowing for plenty of sunny spells to develop throughout the day. Um, this evening, it will be dry with clear spells at first, however some cloud might build up, and it, there may be some showers later on in the evening. On to travel. Uh, there is a road closure due to drainage works on the A30 uh, Long Rock Bypass by Penzance. The road is closed. Avoid. Avoid. <laughs> great, <laughs> great stuff. <laughs> okay, let's just get a bit more of that jingle before we finish up, ladies. Come on. Tasty. Right. Moving on. So next up, let's continue with the bat theme then. Earlier on, we heard a short clip from Ellie Kent. Ellie is a bat researcher at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus. So she's been doing some work on bats, but I'm not going to explain to you what that is. Instead, let's hear it from Ellie herself. Let's hear from that section now. So I'm Ellie and I'm 26 and I'm currently studying conservation and biodiversity at the University of Exeter. Um, and my research project is about bats' use of hedgerows and I kind of want to look into what it is about hedgerows that bats like um, in order to rectify any conservation amendments at the moment and uh, any sustainable farming methods. The show that we're running this on, we're talking a lot about the kind of importance of bats in general for, for ecology. This is something which really needs to be... Um, considered isn't it the actual landscape for the bats so it's all very well saying bats are protected but I guess unless you do something about the environment that they're living in then you can lose them anyway right so I guess hedges must be extremely vital for bats. And not only just for bats but for their prey species as well because they eat insects so um, hedges are very important for insects the trees in hedgerows of course increase the amount of insects as well um, but also hedges are important for bats in terms of commuting and navigational purposes uh, through their use of echolocation and if there was no hedges they wouldn't really be able to get around so um, yeah so important for commuting and foraging and even roosting 
um, some hedges with large trees in, if the bark is cracking away, uh, that's very good roosting spots for small crevice dwelling um, bats such as the barber still. Yeah, I guess it's easy to forget actually that of course bats relying on echolocation remove the hedges, how do they actually see where they're going because yeah. they can't really navigate. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for bats with very short range echolocation. There are some bats that are um, much more adapted to flying over open land but they still do need those features to, to use to get around. Sure, so what are you actually kind of doing when you, in, you kind of, if you like, your day job when you're starting this research, go, going out it's presumably to, to fields and things to look at? Yeah, to so we've um, randomly selected some areas around Cornwall, um, along footpaths and within farms. Um, and so we're going just about two hours before sunset, doing a few botanical surveys along the hedge to find out what's flowering there. So it could be due to if there's flowering ground floor on the ground, there could uh, increase the amount of insects, which of course bats like. Um, we're also looking at the diversity of woody species within the hedge. Um, and then of course the land use either side of the hedge, um, because of course some farms may use a lot of pesticides, um, which can reduce the amount of insects. Um, so yeah, and also we're looking at whether there's local woodland or water features around, which um, bats also like. Um, some bats, such as the Dorbenton, like to um, just pick up their prey off the top of water. Um, so they can be very important for bats as well. Great stuff. Well, that was Ellie Kent, ladies and gentlemen. Ellie Kent um, works on bats. She does bat research on the University of Exeter's Penryn campus. Now, we're going to finish up uh, with bats now, but before I do that, I just want to remind you about this key fact, okay? If you're still not convinced, I just, I just want to remind you, actually. I just want to remind you about this. Bats are the only pollinator of the plant that makes tequila. So, we oh, have right. so, so Sorry, did we get that? Did you, did you, let, let's give that one another listen. One more time. Bats are the only pollinator of the plant that makes tequila. So if you oh, didn't have right. bats, yeah. you wouldn't have tequila. So if you like tequila, then you oh, should well, look yeah. after bats. There, there we go. <laughs> I'm sore, actually. I'm going to go out and uh, help bats now. Yeah. Now that I know that fact. So, bats are great, right? I think of, we, of we, can all, we can all agree. Now... Moving on, uh, well, before we do move on, actually, uh, receiving some requests through on the music front. This has been requested, well, actually, this has been requested by um, a good friend, Sam Barton. Now, it was actually Sam's birthday yesterday, so Sam has a special announcement. Uh, Sam Barton, from Sam to Sam, can I just say a very happy birthday for yesterday? Excellent. Now, here is the song that we promised you, sir. Enjoy. <laughs>
never gets old. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's great. It never gets old, that tune. Right, okay. Requests are flooding in, actually. We've just had a request from one Daniel Padfield for more bat music. Well, <laughs> lucky for you, we actually do have one. How, what a coincidence, Sam. What a coincidence. We, we've actually got one more bat song with us. Okay, well, let, let's give it a listen. Oh, this one's pretty heavy. I'm getting some clangers vibes off this one. Detecting a bit of kind of dead mouse, the bass. Do remember, listeners, that all of this, every single noise you can hear, is actually a bat call in this. I think it's amazing. It's unbelievable. Courtesy of Chris Smith. Brilliant stuff. Right, okay, we are going to move on with a bit of science news now. So you might have heard, well, this is actually coming up quite a lot in the news recently, actually, and that's uh, this strange thing called gene editing, which has recently been discovered to actually exist in quite um, large quantities in certain cephalopods, so in octopuses. Um, uh, You might have seen the news report about octopuses in particular. So we'll talk to Sasha, um, expert uh, behavioural ecologist from the University of Exeter's Penryn campus. We'll be talking to him about that in a second. But first, I, I believe, Sam, you've got, you've got some interesting facts for us, right? Have I? I think you have, yeah. What about? Some, some kind of science news facts, right? Oh, well, OK. Well, so if we want some science news, uh, I guess what struck me this week from science news was uh, Oliver O'Reilly from the University of California uh, has discovered that everyone seems to deal with one major issue in their life that's unexplained which is why do our shoelaces come undone and so he was he found he sort of started working out this question when he was tr- having to redo his daughter's shoelaces all the time and uh, it turns out that the reason shoelaces come undone is because when you're running or moving quickly the tongue of your shoe experiences 7g that's seven times the force of gravity really it moves yeah wow amazing that's, really that's more than an Apollo spacecraft as it re-enters Earth. 7G. And it turns also that it's not enough to just jump up and down to make your shoelace come undone. And it's not enough to swing your leg back and forward. You need a combination of swinging your leg back and forward and jumping up and down. Unbelievable. Well, that's why you just wear slip-ons, mate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, don't bother with them. Velcro yeah, for I'm me. Ro- I'm rocking the vans today, so I'm all good. Great. That was a great fact, mate. And any more for us today? or? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Excellent. Well, let's move on then. Let's uh, listen to that interview with Sasha now. So this is about that gene editing that we've all been hearing about in the news. We've spoken to um, one of our resident experts about this and got her to explain it a little bit and talk about its potential implications as well. So here goes. Let's give that a listen. So, Sasha, welcome back to the show. Um, Hi. Been hearing... Um, a lot of stuff actually there's tons of news reports about this about this octopus gene editing thing mm-hmm. that we've been hearing so maybe i thought let's should we try and explain first of all what on earth it means is going on right it's not just octopus actually it's um octopus squid and cuttlefish so in fact it's all of the cephalopod mollusks except the nautiloids which are the kind of really the really basal primitive earliest form of this type of of mollusk and the real thing that's different about um, the kind of key difference that people have hi- highlighted is that this seems to be going on in the nervous tissue of, of these organisms, of these these types of mollusks. Mm-hmm. And, and they tend to have much more complicated nervous systems than the primitive nautiloids. So the nautiloids have really a relatively simple, don't really do very much learning and stuff, while the octopus, octopus squid and cuttlefish are actually really well known for being the most sophisticated. Yeah, so you get um, examples so oct- octopus is opening jars and things, exactly. don't you? things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, octopus are the kind of seem to be the champions, but squid yeah. and cuttlefish are also pretty sophisticated in what they do. Um, and so this is what a lot of people have speculated the implication that this might 
have for this kind of central nerve, this kind of cleverness, this intelligence, whether there's something going on here. But anyway, so what's the phenomenon? Well, usually the genetic material goes from genetic material to the bodies and, and the features of all of the animals and plants and, or living things in the world that we see around us is the, is the kind of standard dogma. It's even called a dogma. It's so standard. Um, is the DNA sequence is 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 interacts with a with a with a messenger RNA, another type of of of, of molecule that's that's present in in nuclei nuclei of cells amongst other places, and it translates the sequence on the DNA into another sequence in the RNA, and then that RNA then goes away and interacts with a bunch of other things to produce the proteins that the specific sequence of DNA codes for, if you like. So the code is kind of locked in the DNA or comes from the DNA. The mRNA, the messenger RNA, comes along and decodes it, but they don't really do very much. They're very much like a, a messenger, as it, the name suggests. The idea is that they're kind of fairly passive. Um, and, and, and they produce, and then so the proteins are kind of produced from the sequence of, of, the, of the DNA. And that's it, really. There's a little bit of jiggery pokery in places so there are a few examples where that after the mRNA is comes off the DNA with its sequence that there's some editor there can be some editing of this so where other processes go on and I mean I don't know the details of these processes too much myself but but there are other kind of biochemical processes in the cell that can come along and 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 kind of mess with the with the with the with the code on the on the messenger sure, rna so change the message a little splicing is that sure is that well splicing is yeah, yeah. yeah one that way of doing of this yeah um but usually people have inter it's so rare it happens very very rarely on any um rna that's produced from sequences that are associated with with the production of proteins so coding sequences i mean what yeah. what it means is effectively the same coding sequence and DNA can can be used to produce lots of different proteins, protein sequences. It, there's a lot more flexibility, if you like, um, at the level above the gene with what is produced from that gene because what because you, you can have a range of different protein sequences coming from a particular strand. And they discovered that this this pattern that there's a lot a lot of this gene editing goes on in um, in in these particular, the clever um, kind of cephalopod mollusks, the octopus, squid, and nautilus, uh, in the, largely in the nervous system, and it also turns out to be associated with products that are that um, protein products that are associated with excitatory neural neural activity because neural activity there are kind of different ways that n that nervous that the nervous systems can can kind of work you know different nerve nerve cell nerve cell interactions some of them are excitatory some in, in you know when one nerve when one nerve fiber fires it, it it encourages nerve fibers around that nerve fiber that are kind of synapting with it or connecting to it to 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 sort of be more likely to fire or it can be inhibitory so you can see that i mean you can imagine it there are lots of very complicated stories here which we don't need to go into but you can see that actually to kind of have a system that controls behavior and is quite and is flexible and can kind of change the way that behavior is controlled as a response to different kinds of experiences or stuff you know learning and things can involve both inhibitory and excitatory things right or interactions within the network because some things some connections need to be encouraged some connections need to be turned off if because you don't want everything firing at once you want certain things to fire um, and other things not to fire, or certain circuits to be to be connected, and other circuits to be to not be connected. So it seems like it's in the nervous system of these things that you see a lot of this gene editing, what they're calling gene editing, and it seems to be associated with excitatory, um, with the pro with the kind of protein products that are produced in those nervous systems that are associated with excitatory interactions, neural inter interactions. Sure, and I think I think think it's interesting as well because. Given that kind of, given what what that can do, you, you might kind of assume, oh, okay, well, why don't, well, why doesn't everything just do that? Why exactly. don't we all have more flexibility? But actually, perhaps there's a trade-off here going on. This actually touches a little bit on a project that I'm involved with, where we're trying to understand how and when you use, you know, kind of genetic variation 
to uh, control developments versus um, things that your that parents pass on to offspring, so called parental effects. So, you know, fertilized eggs are typically contain more than just nuclear material, more than just DNA. They also contain you know, the bits and pieces in the cell to make it work, and that usually comes from the mother. The mother can pass on um, messages, if you like, potentially, or influences through, you know, what is in the egg cells that she, that, that, that you know, the, the makeup of the egg, the egg cell itself, other than the, the nuclear makeup. Um, so those kind of epigenetic effects can also influence the way that the the development works the way that the the um, bodies animals features are put together but also the experience of the of the of the em developing embryo or the individual itself can also affect how it's put together um, so I mean we've been asking when do those different influences kind of um, you know how strong should those different influences be in different kinds of different kind of lifestyles different kinds of um ecologies so if the world is changing frequently each generation or if it's not changing frequently or you know lots of different a wide range of scenarios that we've been thinking about so to my mind actually the first thing that from this from that kind of lens one of the first things that struck me about this story was this could also be an elaborate way of controlling the construction of the nervous system via these epigenetic these the the non dna inheritance modes from parents um because nervous systems are influenced obviously by individual experience because that's kind of their purpose they're kind of there to help animals you know the, the reason you have a complex nervous system is because it helps you to integrate um what you're experiencing as an individual to control your behavior um but the question is how much how many how much of the kind of what your mother or your grandmother and your mother you know that linear that kind of shorter term lineage effect how that has should influence how you set yourself up to experience the sure. world so the key question for me is is this an are these kind of um epigenetic uh is this is this editing machinery yes what, how the the gene products are edited is that inherited yeah, sure. There's nothing in any of the studies that I can see, and I've done a sort of to preparing myself for the for this chat. I've just kind of had a brief look, and it doesn't seem like anybody's asked that question yet. So for yeah. me, that would be a kind of a key question to ask. Because if it is, then this is fascinating because it does it does suggest that we don't really set ourselves up to have very strong effects of, you know, physiological effects. So yes, humans, we do a lot of teaching we do a lot of social learning if you like we can we can influence our offspring um you know with what we know about the world and what we've learned about the world through behaviorally you know through kind of you know guiding learning and all the rest of it but this suggests maybe there's another route that that we don't go down for for whatever reasons and you know we've we've built some models to try and understand when those those kind of effects should predominate and what they've done i mean and you can use genetic variation in the same way <laughs> as a source of information about the world if you like or the likely state about the world what they seem to have been doing is getting rid of genetic variation as a sure. source at all they still have individual they still have the kind of in individual experience of the world if this is a a kind of a paternal a parental effect you know one of these kind of inherited short relatively short term inherited effect um then it suggests it suggests that that um for some reason they've gone for that combination maternal very strong parental maternal effect effects on the on how to wire up the nervous system and you know combining that with with you know individual experience and we have actually i was just bringing up a model that that we we built to look at when these things would happen and it turns out that a lot of the the ways that we analyze this we're looking at how the environment changes each generation and when it changes a lot or doesn't change very much there's very strong relationships between what happened last generation and what happens this generation in those kind of scenarios of course inherited information becomes is a logical thing to use and actually can swamp 
you know can make individuals relatively insensitive to their own experience if it's if it's partic- if the if the kind of environment environmental change is structured in in appropriate ways and it turns out actually that a lot our model would say a lot that that these maternal effects should be very strong and and you should almost have a kind of Lamarckian inheritance might be an optimal way to do things so actually for the listeners that might need a little bit of translation so Jean Baptiste Lamarck was a was an evolutionary a French evolutionary or a French naturalist who came up with an idea about evolutionary change or the way that evolution might work and it was associated with the notion that individual could pass on changes that happened over their lifetimes to their offspring sure and so people dismiss this because it it was you know various kind of classic studies showed that this is this this doesn't just doesn't happen or doesn't happen very much what our model suggests though is that this kind of notion that if you change the way you are and you can pass those changes on to your offspring fairly reliably that actually that can be a really good thing to do and a really robust thing to do in a quite a wide range of environments we concluded in our model in the paper that we wrote about this model that we likely don't see this maybe because actually the reliability because one of the key things is how reliably can can you pass on your the bodily state sure. that, that yeah. you have to your offspring, given that your offspring are developing from a, a single cell, and what you're doing effectively is giving them a single cell for most organisms. Sure. I mean, yeah. mammals, have, and mammals and birds have other ways of doing things during development to influence their organisms, but not, but, but very few animals and plants do do things that way this is in a form kind of additional information other than the genetic material yeah, per se, uh, yeah, it? it's, yeah yeah it's epigenetics yeah epigenetics term. um so the notion though is that what we concluded is that maybe that's a fairly imp- it's fairly difficult thing to achieve sure. like practically because what you're largely passing on is a cell and a nucleus and so yeah you can pass on chemicals and stuff in the you know biochemicals in the molecules in the cell or you know certain kind of changes in the way that the cells set up um but you're limited in how much of what you the way that you are as a sophisticated is a kind of fully formed adult you can pass on to your offspring so it's possible though that this is maybe a very so the going i mean it's kind of convoluted way to go back to what we're talking about here but if these if this machinery for translating the dna you know and you know the different ways of doing it can be passed on fairly reliably in kind of cytoplasm of cells or even in nuclei the non the non dna bits of the nucleus um quite reliably then this may be a very a relatively reliable channel that can pass on quite a high level of sophistication um or sophisticated take on the kinds of things that the your mother and your grandmother might have experienced um and if that's the case then then we've got an interesting we're in an interesting realm that we'd speculated upon should be there theoretically um but maybe maybe this is a kind of this could end up being evidence that that kind of thing actually does exist in a system where that mode of inheritance is is reliable enough um because it because according to our analysis it it does really well with a with a lot of a wide range of different types of environments it's actually a very efficient way of of producing really well set up offspring offspring that are going to be good at whatever the challenges are in a world where there's going to be variation in across generations in what you know what the world's like what the, what the ecological challenges are sure. It'd be really fascinating then to see whether actually it turns out this gene editing system, as I've been saying, is inherited yeah. on a very simple level. Just to check, I'm kind of understanding what you're saying then. So essentially, this gene editing process in, in these uh, cephalopods is essentially saying, okay, with this one genome, you've got multiple kind of outputs of the genome, if you like multiple yeah. proteins and things. But what you're saying is possibly, what if that syst- if that itself is heritable? So yeah. if if the mother, for example, has chosen a particular set of proteins from that single genome that kind of choice if you like that can be passed on so the variation amongst mothers yeah in the particular way or grandmothers are not just the mother it will be the short-term lineage her short-term maternal lineage if you like um 
So it's it's their particular way of translating a fixed genetic set of instructions. Sure. Um, whether that can be whether whether that's being reliably passed on across generations. So to my mind, there are potentially some really interesting evolutionary kind of consequences, but we need to know more about the, how it all works before we can tell. Yeah. The moment, but if there isn't fine. reliable inheritance, actually, I don't. It's difficult to really see too much kind of very radical evolutionary consequences because it would sure. just be if there isn't really strong inheritance of the particular ways that your mothers or grandmothers have done stuff then effectively you're just talking about a kind of another version of individual experience sure. if you like yes um yeah. now of course it's i mean it's a different way of doing it so it'll be interesting to know why but i think the consequences in terms of you know what the lineage is you know doing or the kinds of worlds that these lineages could do well in or the kinds of problems these lineages could do well in from a behavioral perspective um may not be all that radical and revolutionary but if it is inherited then we are we may be in some really interesting space um it doesn't have to be inherited i mean it doesn't have to be a major evolutionary thing because it turns out also cephalopod mollusks are well known for having for having the only other version of the kind of eyes that we have in the animal kingdom so the kind of lens but they inter it, they evolved it in a completely independent way so while our retinas are inside out in the sense that all of the light sensing bits are embedded in the retina with the light coming through the back of them so where the wires if you like come out of the of the of the retinal cells yeah um so there's a lot of weirdness there i mean that makes for a relatively inefficient system it also means we have a blind spot because there has to be a place where those the all of the the wires go into you know through the retina away from where the light's coming from away away from the outside and into your brain so that you can actually kind of process the kind of the kind of the the light stuff cephalopod having pretty much the same setup it's just that their retinas are the right way around, right way around so they don't actually have a blind spot so that's an example where these are actually a kind of lineage of things that do that do things quite similarly to a whole bunch of vertebrates that that we're that we know a lot about and that are associated with very sophisticated behavior and sophisticated structures but they just do it in a different way for some because of some evolutionary historical kind of accident of the way sure. that they started out so it's possible you know it doesn't have to be the case that there's some major evolutionary implications here it's just possible that the way that their nervous systems started yeah. meant that this was a this was a kind of a logical way to to control things and then they just yeah they it, just it just, just became very very conservative it was a, quite an efficient way of doing things um and it just stayed that way but every but the rest of life or the other bits and pieces were associated with kind of complex nervous system stuff you know the the lineages that went down the complex nervous system and complex sophisticated behavioral stuff they just ended up controlling things in a different way so it's not it doesn't have to be this interesting thing i'm a theoretical biologist so i tend to get excited by potentially <laughs> you know far reaching and yeah. weird and wonderful kind of implications so this this immediately kind of appealed to me for that reason and there's a crucial question that can easily i mean it's it's, a, it's an observation that may not be easy to to find out about i'm not suggesting that the experiments to show that it's inherited are necessarily straightforward and could be done quickly but it is a very clear-cut observation that, that should be taken to my mind at this stage sure. in 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 proceedings and that which would tell us you know how interesting this is from an evolutionary perspective cool so whilst it's in its infancy potentially that's actually going to be a very interesting maybe even fruitful area for absolutely science. <laughs> i mean and it's already attracted a lot of attention just because sure. it's weird i mean just because yeah. they're alien i mean the, and these things are right i mean they are actually almost archetypically alien we we use we depict a lot of our kind of fantasies about what alien life would be like sure we depict them as being tentacled and well and, like in, in a way the recent film as well they they basically were octopuses exactly and aliens. And squids and things yeah so <laughs> so i mean they are extremely alien weird things and they have alien eyes they now have, we now know they have alien they do alien things in their brains even though they produce 
extremely complicated and sophisticated behavior as a consequence. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Sasha. I think we'll finish up there. Thanks okay. for your time. No worries. Yeah. Ladies and gents, Professor Sasha Dahl. Thank you very much for that, Sasha. We'll be hearing more from Sasha next week. Now, um, there was, I believe he did have some terms and conditions for appearing on this show, Sam. Is that right? We've got <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, so Sasha said he would only do an interview with us if we played a song request by him. And the song that he requested... Oh, no. Um, oh, no. It's actually Justin Bieber. He said anything, really. Um, yeah, and anything Bieber. Okay. Anything Bieber, so... Uh, oh, do we have to? It's, it was, it was his, his decision. Oh, okay. Well, it's only fair. Okay, well, give it a whirl. Sasha's request sorted. Now, we've got a very special feature for you now. We've actually got an interview with Gareth Makin. Now, Gareth is a, well, a man who's been in many bands. He's been touring throughout his life. So, Gareth, welcome to the show. Can you hear us? I can, Ben, yeah. Excellent. A very warm welcome to you. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. You? Yes, fine. Thank you. Uh, very nice bat feature, by the way. I was uh, very impressed because oh, we are thank you. very close to Chester Zoo where we are, so we visit the bat house very regularly. So. Excellent. You can go and see some flying foxes then, apparently. Have you seen them yeah, in there? Yeah, we have. They're the really big ones that tend to scare yeah. the children. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. Well, probably not, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let's, chat, let's chat bands because okay. we, we played some um, Pink Pumps actually last last week on the show. We got, we're going to play some again this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you could just give us out an, as an outline first of what of what um, what bands you've been with, and whereabouts you've been playing, and things like that. Yeah, sure. Well, 
I mean, I've been sort of playing for uh, playing drums for about 28 years, so I've been in bands for pretty much most of that time. Um, most of them have sort of been sort of local, sort of privateer bands doing sort of weekend gigs and function gigs, which are pretty much I think a lot of musicians do, um, you know, make ends meet. But yes, I have ploughed the original 402, um, which is incredibly tough. Oh, so nice. I, my, my sort of hat comes off to, to everybody that does that and makes a success out of it because it's really hard work and you have got to love it. Um, and also, it often takes quite a bit of money investment for no return at all. Sure. So yeah, I kind of did that for a while and then realised that only a very, very small, lucky percentage sort of people make that. So despite sort of radio airplay and, and all the things that you do these days, um, you it is sort of luck to get yourself picked up, right place, right time. Um, so yeah, I just sort of went back to to playing sort of in the on the local circuit. So and and that can be, you know, just a, a weekend gig at a pub, um, right the way through to sort of doing festivals through the summer. Um, and I've been sort of up and down the country doing it. Um, you know, we've, we're fortunate enough to sort of travel around. Um, so yeah, it, it's sort of it's still a journey. And I still love doing it, and the financial rewards are minute and yeah, minuscule, sure. but the emotional rewards are massive. Yeah, it's, it's still worth doing it. Yeah. And I, I guess particularly for a drummer, though, I mean, one of the things which immediately strikes me for a drummer is, is it not just really tiring playing at gigs and things? Because <laughs> essentially, uh, the guitarist just gets to sit there, right, and just, well... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, they, yeah they rock up with their amplifiers and their guitars, <laughs> and they're set up within about five minutes. Unfortunately, the the... The drummers at the back, the sort of long-suffering souls <laughs> of the band, who have to set up all that scaffolding and uh, you know and and make all the noise apparently, <laughs> um, and are the first in and the last to leave. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it is. I mean it keeps you fit definitely. Um, it it can, if you're not very careful, make you deaf quite quickly because <laughs> you tend yeah. to be sat at the back next to all the amplification. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, safety tip, kids. Make sure that you're using earplugs as soon as you start playing yeah. bands. <laughs> then you won't lose your hearing. It's, um, it's, it's good. But yeah, yeah. It, it's. Um, I, I think really, whatever part you play in a band, whether you're at the back in the rhythm section, or you know you're you're just uh, you know you're a backing singer, or you're a percussionist, anybody that gets involved in the process, you do it for those gigs really that are. You, that takes you to a different place. Sure. You know, you might have seen a band, um, and you know, you you maybe follow them on a couple of gigs. Or you might see them sort of, you know, one year, and you see them year after, and suddenly you go, "That was a life changing gig. That that was great." Well, the musicians on stage found something. They they kind of hooked into something. You know, whether it was they're really tight or they're coming from the right place musically. Sure. Yeah. And it really sort of lifts you, and that's pretty much why we do it. There are gigs where you are playing to bar staff and you know maybe a few punters and and that's it yeah and you take those and you go okay well you know you've got to pull out what you've got to pull out from those but the gigs where it's busy it's heaving everybody kind of gets it that's really you know why we all do it i think yeah i mean i guess um, you can't replicate those feelings right no, i mean how else, no, how else no, would it, you? it's um it's an amazing thing really um and, and i would encourage anybody that has ever touched an instrument and yeah. maybe a you know, a bedroom player or, uh, you know, uh, just somebody who's just interested, find a local jam night, find yeah. a local music group, whatever it takes, find friend, colleagues at work, you'll never know, somebody's got, you know, might have a guitar that they've not dusted off in years. Yeah, exactly. Get together and play. Even if you don't play live, it doesn't matter. Get a rehearsal room somewhere, a sh garden shed, it doesn't matter. I think, you know, to, to be able to share in that is, is really, really incredible. Yeah, well, as you said, I mean, e even if the financial reward doesn't happen to be that great, you're saying it's, it's well worth it. So you should oh, still yeah. just just Absolutely. go for it. Absolutely, there there are plenty of, of of musicians who are really struggling, um, you know, who who just do it for the love of doing it, and because the the percentage of the, the people that are actually making some money out of music these days is very small. Sure. Um, you know, the, the 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 some of the bands that I hear on on your your radio station. They are obviously really pushing, you know, all of their efforts and all of their energies and, and finances into trying to make themselves, 
not just sort of necessarily successful, because that, that's a really hard term to define, yeah, but yeah. trying to make themselves sort of financially sustainable. It, you know, you, you can't, it's not a money pit completely. You've got to have, if it's your only sole income, you've got to have some kind of outlet in terms of, you know, merchandise or CD sales, something like that. Uh, but yeah, get involved. That's what I always say to everybody. You know, it doesn't matter what standard you're at. Get involved playing, um, and it and yeah, it, it doesn't always take you to a different place, but yeah. it can do. <laughs> do you have a particular memory of a, of a favourite gig? Because I mean, I, just before you were saying, um, you know, about these feelings playing at these gigs when they're when they're busy, and that feeling is really incredible. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few. I mean, one that comes to mind because it's kind of, I mean, so it's sort of coming up. Um, we, we did a, a Rhythm and Blues Festival. Where I was in a band called Drive Northwest, who was sort of a fairly big, sort of bluesy, sort of funk outfit. And um, really, we, did, we used to do some gigs over in Colm, which is up sort of Burnley Way, just, just sort of north of Manchester, sure. uh, out in the hills. And they do a Rhythm and Blues Festival every year, which is kind of nationally and internationally recognised. And we used to play um, maybe three or four gigs over a weekend. Um, and a lot of the um, a lot of the sort of venues there were busy with music fans, people that really wanted to listen. Um, and we did a gig at the Queen's Hotel, which is one of the venues there. Um, and I just remember sort of sitting there at the back and whatever it was, you know, you almost forget to keep playing because you yeah, sort of go, yeah. oh, that's just amazing. And you say, oh, hang on. No, I yeah. actually should be concentrating <laughs> on what I'm doing. And, and that's the... Um, that's probably one of the greatest ones. I think one of the ones where I went to go and see a gig, um, Radiohead uh, just uh, just released Kid A, and right, they came yeah. to play uh, Warrington, which is a real sort of stick hicks town. Um, <laughs> and you think, well, why are Radiohead coming here? But anyway, they did, and big top and everything. And I went two nights, and I just remember watching that gig, watching them play the new material, really yeah, yeah. perfectly, almost. Um, just thinking, okay, that's a game changer, and it really, you know, you were somewhere else, and and at that point, I kind of changed a lot of sort of what I was listening to for a while, because that's what music does, you know, we, we kind of takes us on different sort of journeys, and sometimes it's a cul-de-sac, and you've got to back out, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it's, a, you know, it's like Route 66, and you just keep going. Yeah, sure. So I guess that the feeling goes both ways then, because I mean, you're saying, um, you know, go, going to gigs, you, I mean, everyone knows that kind of feeling if you've been to a gig and you really enjoyed it. You feel like you're really connecting w yeah. with, with everyone else there yeah. almost. And you're saying that kind of goes both ways, because as a musician yourself, you also get that feeling when you're actually performing. Yeah, That's I mean, just... it, it's very hard to, it's very hard to get sometimes because a lot of people, particularly if you play in a sort of casual day in a, in a pub or something like that, People haven't necessarily come to see the band a lot of the time. Yeah, sure. So you're, you're trying to win them over a little bit. You, you know, you're trying to make a connection with somebody you don't really know. Um, I think it's a lot easier for, for bands, you know, the, the bigger bands. Um, I mean, I was listening to, um, just because I thought, oh, Cornish radio session, I was listening to P, PJ Harvey. Just, oh, yeah, just nice, morning. nice. And you just think, okay, well, you go and see PJ Harvey, you're pretty much, you know what she's about, you know, you know, you can make a connection with her straight away because you're familiar with the music. It's really difficult for a lot of the bands in, in pubs and what have you um, to do that. But once you do, once you've kind of got somebody, and it kind of, you know, you've got to make sure that you look like you're enjoying yourself. It's not, you're not reading the paper. You're not, um, you're not sort of hating being there. But when you know that there's a bit of connection back and two, because, you know, it doesn't matter how big the musician is, whether you're, I don't know, Madonna or uh, just some you know, some drummer in it or a guitarist in a pub that you've just seen. Everybody fundamentally is, you know, we're all human beings, we're all made of the same DNA, and um, that connection should be made easily. Yes. It's just that sometimes it's in a bigger place. Um, and I think with, with a lot of the sort of local gigs that you, that you tend to do, that is a sort of a little bit of a battle every time. And some people you don't get, and some people you do, and that's fine, and that's fab, and... It might, they might not necessarily be a fan of the band and what you do, or but they might like one tune and they go sure, home yeah. thinking, "Oh, I really like that song," and they were, you know, they were really nice guys. That's good enough, you know. Connecting with one person is is great. If you're connecting with thirty five thousand, then that's a whole other thing, and yeah, yeah. tends to lead to massive mental and emotional problems later on. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, so let's let's hope let's hope we don't essentially. No, that's it, absolutely. <laughs> Keep the audience small. That's yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's what I always say. <laughs> Keep the audience small and the gig price is low. <laughs> Well, yeah. Let, let's let's come back to you then, because okay. you, uh, we, we's, um, you know, you're telling us that you've you've essentially been in a lot of bands. You've been playing drums for for a while, but let's talk about where you started out, if you don't mind. I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, maybe you've got some advice for musicians who are starting out themselves, and maybe they can take something away from your own journey through music. Yeah, yeah. I, I think really, um, you have got to love what you do. I've been in a couple of bands where the 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 sort of modus operandi of the band was to basically be famous they wanted to get a record deal they want because that's the trappings of that is what they actually wanted love what you do love the music if somebody gets it fabulous if they don't get it keep pushing um it, it's that that sort of innate desire to just play and and practice as well yes um i do see a lot of bands on the circuit and they're having a great time but they're not necessarily presenting the best product they can yes. the audience and i use the term product um bands in pubs and clubs and on the local scene are struggling for gigs because you know money is tight from the club owners from the pub owners um you've got to put on the best act so that people come back into the pub so i would say make sure you practice use all the time you can particularly if you're a younger musician make sure that um you're using your time to practice now. You know, if you're in sure. school or college, do it now. As soon as life hits later on, you know, it might be family, it might be college, whatever it might be, you will find that your time is squeezed. Yeah, you've really got to push you've to actually to get any time when in. You can. And if you are an older musician and you, you know, practice that five minutes here and there, that's great, that's, that's good enough. If that's what you can do, then do that and make sure it's good practice. Do that. Also, I mean, there's a lot of talk of self-promotion. Yep. YouTube is is sort of the place to go. It is full. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of artists, lots of acts trying to do it. But self-promote. Get a good website. There's no excuse for a bad one these days. Get your stuff on there. And then, you know, use social media. Bombard it. Friends, you know, get them first. Um, and then later on, hopefully, you'll start to... To pull more people in but all through this process just make sure that you're doing it for the right reason and that's that you love playing you know uh, it doesn't matter what gig i'm on if i'm sat behind the kit and i'm playing i'm a happy guy yeah you know yeah. And i think that's the thing that there are a lot of younger players out there who just see the bright lights big city kind of thing and just want to go for yeah. it and, and don't get me wrong go for it but make sure that you've given out the best sort of product whether it's you've got to work a bit harder on the songs you know whether it's use of dynamics in songs I, I do hear a lot of young bands where the song is kind of at one level you know yes. push and pull you've got to light and shade give the listener a bit of chance if it's a punk number ram it down somebody's throat absolutely you know uh, speed on 11 um, because that's what you need to do but if it's like a maybe a a sort of indie number, you just pull that light and shade, look at different things, don't look at a standard drum beat, don't look at a standard guitar part, all those little things to be creative, that's the main thing, but yeah, love what you do first. Yeah, absolutely, concentrate on, on the journey almost, rather than the end goal. It's, absolutely, it's yeah, cool. because not many people get that end goal, and the sure. people that do, you know, I, I know plenty of friends who, who hit, you know, the record deal, and... Um, and got it, and it's not over. It's yes. not the sort of the door, the keys to the, the executive bathroom, as it were. You've got to keep pushing all the way through that, writing stuff, don't give up. You know, the, the, the people that, that put out their first album have probably been writing songs for that first album for 10 years. Yes. Yeah. You know, which makes the second album really difficult. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where'd you go from there? Really? You know, the, you know, have that sort of bank of material and and don't stop. You know, these these people that when they go out on the road, they're writing all the time because that's what they do. That's what they love to do. Not that there's a deadline. Sure. You know, we haven't got an assignment to get in, or or the record company knocking on your door saying, "Where's the next album?" 
it's basically, well, I've written a load more songs. Yeah. And what are these about? You know, and, and I think the other, the other thing that's really important when you're a younger band, make sure lyrical content doesn't sound like a GCSE English <laughs> exercise. <laughs> it's got to be about something. Yeah. It can be Boy Loves Girl or Girl Loves Girl or Boy Loves Boy. That's great, then that still works. But if you want to say something, make sure you say it and try and, re- try and remove any cliches. Yeah, good advice. Well, Gareth, thank you very much for coming on the show to talk to us about music. We'll have to get you on again soon, actually, in a couple of weeks, if you're up for that. Again. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Thanks. Also, well, just before you go, maybe you could maybe you could recommend some music for us to play next time. You, you could get some um, music from the Pink Pumps to us, maybe. We've got one song. We've got Not My Idea of Love to play next. That's true. I, I, the fabulous Mark Pesterbridge. I was not a, not a drummer on this track, so it's actually before I joined the band. But, yeah, fabulous Mark Pesterbridge played drums on this one. Excellent. But, well... Uh, yeah, I think really uh, there's a young, uh, well, a youngish artist that I'm working with at the moment called Johnny Tristram, and he has a new album out called Houston. Um, he's a sort of acoustic balladeer, singer songwriter, and that's great. You should check that out. Great. Glad you mentioned him, actually. We've got one of his tunes up next as well. <laughs> it's all good. Good stuff. Brilliant. Well, Gareth, thank you very much. If you have any more um, tracks, do get them to us. We'd love to play them on here. And Thank thanks for talking to us today. Groovy. Take care. See you, Gareth. Thanks. See you now. Bye bye. Good. Great stuff. Great interview, Sam. What do you think of that? Very interesting. Brilliant. Yeah, lots of insight there into uh, yeah the kind of things to think about if you're starting out in the music world or if you're still in the music world. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think love what, that. What really came across was that you you need to do it because you enjoy it, not because you're searching for fame. Yeah, exactly. Well, as promised, let's uh, finish up with a couple of songs then. So first up, we're going to play this. Uh, Pink Pumps number, Not My Idea of Love. Listen, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. Listen, I'll tell you what I'm feeling. Got a feeling you don't care. Pumps, great stuff. Now, as Gareth mentioned, actually, in that um, short interview we had with him a second ago, uh, this is a new artist, Johnny Tristram. Now, he's just released his album, Houston, and he actually sent it to us recently. Really, really nice songs on that album. We're going to play one of them uh, this week, and next week we're going to play a few more. So this particular song stood out to me. Um, Quite an emotional song. Lovely. It's acoustic. Um, Let's play it. Really nice. Choices that you make 
We're looking from the outside Such an easy game to play Just thinking of what could have been That's such a waste of time These separate and these broken dreams Weigh heavy on my mind I think of happy times when you were there All the jokes, the laughs that we once shared Unfinished memories fill this room Grace of God, I lost your smile Only angels high get to gaze in your eyes Heaven knows where you've gone too soon But you've gone too soon I can't help but see your pain And it's not your cross to bear Time that he needed you With your heart and your soul you can He's looking down from skies above And I know that he could see All that love that's there in your heart You can't turn out When you were there All the jokes, the laughs that we once shared Unfinished memories fill this room To the grace of God I lost your smile Only angels high get to gaze in those eyes Heaven knows where you've gone too soon And I can't look back No, I can't look back Cos I know you've gone too soon Happy times when you were there All the jokes, the laughs that we once shared Unfinished memories fill this room To the grace of God I lost your smile The angels I get to gaze in those eyes Heaven knows why you've gone too soon And you've gone too soon And that was Johnny Tristram as recommended by Gareth that we just spoke to Uh I really enjoyed that, and you should follow him on Facebook if you like. Uh, there's a link to Johnny Tristram on our Facebook page. Brilliant, that's us done, isn't it? So that's we'll, it. We'll leave you with a, this as a request, Sam, is so it? This is uh, it's more of a dedication. I'm sending this one out to Alicia. Uh, Excellent. And, yeah. Thanks. It's well, bye for now. Bye. Messages keep getting clearer Radio's on and